Yeah. Uh huh. No, I get it. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't let you eat people on Thanksgiving. I don't think they'd let you do that. Oh, hi. Jared Krzyzewski here. Hi. And welcome to Creature Corner. It's nice to have you. Well, I hope you're excited for a new streaming episode, as I am excited to be here with you. Uh, joining us today, very excited, is uh, our special uh, co-host and guest, uh, Matt Miller. He's here today. Come on in, Matt. Matt. He's supposed to be here. Oh, 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 that's right. He's going to see Resident Evil. So, <laughs> never mind. Uh, sorry, guys. No Matt Miller today. You're just going to have to deal with me. But hopefully Matt will join us next week and he can give us his review of, uh, of Resident Evil. I've heard uh, great things uh, about it. Uh, I am your host, uh, Mr. Wimbley Pimblesmere of the Pimblesmere Consortium. So thank you for joining me, Mr. Wimbley Pimblesmere. Uh, so uh, what is the prompt for today? Uh, normally... Like on the stream, I'd like to do more, um, you know, get get more finished pieces and, and take take you through my process that way. But, uh, you know, since uh, uh, Matt had to go see Resident Evil, uh, we're going to be doing uh, uh, just a, a brand new prompt and we're going to try and see how far I can take this. Hopefully, you know, maybe even get a finished piece out, you know, before uh, before Thanksgiving, because that's the idea, right? Is to, is to get stuff and finish it. It's very important to finish what you start. Um, so I'm going to start with a new one, a uh, new prompt today. We're going to see how far we can take it. Um, but today's prompt, since we have a holiday coming up, uh, we're going to go with thanks killing. So gobble, gobble, murder. It's very exciting. So uh, I'm going to take you through my process and, and we're just going to, we're just going to get going. So I hope you're excited for monsters and creatures and all kinds of horrible things. We're going to talk about, you know, as we, uh, as we go on sculpting. So thanks for joining me uh, today on creature corner. So um, where I'm at now with my gobble gobble murder is uh, I, I'm started started with a sketch and um, you know, as, as always, <laughs> uh it's good to uh you know if you don't have like a, an idea right away um you know reach out to friends talk and brainstorm i always find like reaching out to people is the best possible way to like brainstorm ideas um but uh eventually once you get an, an idea going then you can start uh you know, building off of that. So I just noodled this little drawing. It's not meant to be beautiful or anything. This is just a quick noodly noodle, uh, just to like get an idea. So the idea was Thanks Killing, and I haven't seen the movie. There is a movie called Thanks Killing, um, which I have not seen. Um, it looks like one of those like CD level movies. Uh, you know, uh, looks fun. So I, I decided to just spin off and do my own like what would that look like? And, and, uh, you know, I was pitching with Matt the idea and, you know, as he was telling me he was going to abandon me, uh, for tonight's stream. So I just said, uh, okay, we'll come up with, uh, you know, what should we do? I, I figured, figured, you know, uh, a Thanksgiving, uh, day prompt would be good. I'm going to hold on. I got my dog. He wants to come in. Come here. Come on. So, you guys get to meet my dog. This is one of three. This is Simon. Say hi, Simon. Yeah, he is. Uh, his English is terrible, but he's a he's a good dog. Oh, hello, Jeff. What am I thankful for this year? Well, uh. You know, I, I'm always uh, thankful for family, uh, you know, good friends, family, you know, we have a, a 
body to live in if we're, you know, alive. It's good to be alive because then you can make monsters, right? It's cool. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, so I was uh, manifesting this story because I thought, okay, let's do a Thanksgiving Day monster, uh, you know, along the theme of turkeys, right? Because you got to do the turkey thing. Um, so I was kind of like leaning towards like A24 lamb territory where, um, where it was like, you know, maybe like a deformed uh, kind of like human turkey hybrid. Um, so that's kind of where the idea gestated. And then uh, I got kind of a mental flash of uh, like this turkey huddle, like this turkey human huddled uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a barn somewhere. Like, yeah, Chern uh, Chernobyl human turkey, right? Exactly. So um, that's kind of where I was running with it uh, in the beginning. Like, oh, where turkey would be fun too. Um, so I'm going to go with this cause I, I figured it's, it's kind of messed up and, and weird. And, uh, I thought this would be a nice, uh, way to start. So, uh, we're going to just go ahead and jump right in. Now, uh, always I recommend, um, you know, if you can do a little thumbnail, do a little doodle, uh, something that's going to, uh, you know, jumpstart the process a little bit. Um, most of the days now for client work. You know, I'll, I'll just dive right into 3D. You get an image or you get a prompt and it's pretty specific. If I don't know where I'm going, then I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, noodle out some thumbs. Um, my my drawing skills have severely atrophied over the years, uh, just spending so much time in 3D. So my, my sketching now looks very, very ugly, but uh, it's just enough to, like, give me an idea. I mean, I... If, if I probably put as much time into drawing as I did, you know, anything else, I would, I'd probably feel better about it. Um, so I'm just going to dive into, uh, into ZBrush. So, uh, and then I'm going to put on a little mute music, something new. That's very spooky. Let's put on something a little, Ooh, that's spooky. There we go. I like spooky. And that's what, uh, uh, that's what I'm about. I'm about spooky things and, uh, feeling, Feeling generally terrified. Let's see. All right. So uh, normally when I get started, it's kind of like um, I'm, I'm going shopping a little bit. So you'll probably see me, um, you know, poking around up here in my in my light box. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You'd like to think so. Uh, it's all uh, it's all hidden from view, so uh, no no chance. I even uh, I even have my quick saves cleared just for that uh, just for that reason. Hello, Alex Alvarez, the man, the master. Thank you for joining. Very excited to have you with us. All right. So uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. And, and usually when I get started on any project, I'm, I kind of go right to the library. Um, just pick out the things that are, you know, uh, quick and easy. Um, I have a lot of base meshes that I built over the years because I, I like to get uh, <laughs> ET so cool. Uh, that's buff ET. And if you're lucky he'll make an appearance tonight. I was hoping, I was hoping to hold off on Buff ET because I wanted, I wanted it to reveal it to Matt because Matt has not seen Buff ET yet, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe Buff ET will come out tonight. We'll find out. We'll find out. All right. So I'm just going to jump open with my little base mesh. And this is like a modified scan of a dude pretty pretty simple and um nowadays uh you know you can expect clients are probably going to give you some kind of uh some kind of scan or base you know especially if you're working on top of uh an actor we're gonna just like melt his face out real quick 
And so then working with my, my sketch in mind, we're just going to start hammering this thing home. It's going to be really skinny. It's going to be really weird. Did I make this base or can I buy or can you buy it somewhere? Um, this was a, a base that I got uh, from uh, while working on a project. So this was a, a, a scan of an actor that that I then modified. Um, but what I recommend if you're looking for like really good base meshes, uh, I recommend going to um, 3D scan store. You know, back in the days when I when I uh, was just starting, um, there there really wasn't a lot of this stuff available, uh, base meshes and everything. So I would we were taking low res base meshes and then we would work work on them from that. Um, nowadays, uh, I'll start with uh, these scan data meshes. Um, one because they're already human, right? You already have realistic proportions, anatomy, um, and a lot of these have textures on top of them as well. Um, so when I'm, when I'm starting kind of any project now, I'll, I'll just, I'll pick it one of these and I'll, I'll start modifying it. Uh, so that's 3d scan store. Let me, I, I'll, I'll put that link in the, uh, the chat for you, but yeah, it's, um, these, these are really great. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use, I'll use scan data, I'll modify it, you know, however I need to, um, so you can see. Uh, you know, I bought a lot of their clothing as well. It's it's just really nice because it's really a high res. I mean, it's scans, so you can't get more uh, more realistic. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so Jeff in the chat is saying uh, he's been using DAS models, um, and um, yeah, I used to use DAS, and then uh, uh, I, the program is so clunky that I I I just gave up on on DAS. Um, occasionally I will, I will pull out a DAS model if I need a, a specific pose. Um, usually if I'm going to illustrate over a, a 3d model, uh, then, then I'll use a DAS model. Uh, but you can see in like my base meshes, music is very spooky. You can see my base meshes that, um, I have a lot of them. The ones I end up using the most are, are, you know, ones that I've, I've, uh, used over and over again. Um, I'm, I'm sure it'll probably become apparent in, <laughs> if you look at my work. Um, but I, I have like base meshes from, from everything that I can pull from, uh, anything possible. Um, and if I, if I modify a base mesh enough, uh, then I'll save it out and, and you build up your library this way and, uh, it becomes really efficient. So anytime I sculpt the base, you can see I have a few in like, poses doing other things oh you know what i forgot about this guy i have uh i have this guy already built which uh i uh, you may recognize from the first episode from from creepy moon boy and uh this uh is actually a, a it was scan date of javier botet uh ac an amazing actor that i um also modified and you know other stuff but i think i'm gonna stick with richard for now um, but what's nice is that it just gives you, you know, landmarks already to work with. Um, what I would say is that if you're a new 3D artist or you're, you know, just uh, uh, brand new to, to, to anatomy in general, um, spend some time just practicing uh, anatomy and just getting good at that. Um, Pack the sculpting anatomy a whole bunch. I'm just gonna melt those hands down, melt the feet down a little bit. And I'm gonna probably just start throwing him into a pose um, to get some gesture. Right now, he's a little, uh, you know, the the problem with with base models is they always come in a little stiff anyway. So, so to get my pose, probably just to keep this in mind. Save this out. We'll call it Turkey Man. 
I will call him TM for Turkey Man. My file saving is like very shortcut. Like everything is like is very fast and loose. You know, just so I can save stuff out very quickly. All right. So uh, I've collected some other references here as well of these horrid little things. And, uh, you know, I figured, you know, we can put this, uh, you know, down his face and neck, something, something kind of like that. And it's just really weird, you know, texture going on in here, surface turbulations and uh, other suggestive things happening. I am working on the uh, the latest ZBrush update, uh, twenty two point one, but I have not um, I've not really gotten to play with any of the the new new features yet. Oh, uh, this is uh, this software is called PureRef. Uh, just uh, answering the question here. Yeah. Uh, this is called PureRef. And it's like 15 bucks. Um, what's really great about this is you can, um, it helps you kind of collate all your references and you can also put it on top of your, uh, put it on top of your screen. And then, uh, and then what's nice is you can kind of infinite zoom in here and zoom in and out and do other stuff. I have some other references that are off screen. Uh, they're going to be a little bit more horrific and a little bit more um, inappropriate for uh, for streaming. Um, I have a very morbid sense of curiosity, um, and so uh, I'll I'll put a lot of that in. Um, but one, what I'll do is let me uh, let's see. What I'll do just to kind of show you how I work, just in general, is I have a I have a reference folder. Um, you know, I have, um, thousands and thousands of references, uh, that I, I've collected over the years. And, um, this is my special effects and makeup, uh, reference folder. So this is one, one of my favorites that I just continue to add to. And, um, because I, I kind of base everything that I do in, in practical effects, um, what I'll do is, uh, you know, anytime I see anything kind of practical and cool on screen, uh, I immediately like grab it and, you know, save it. If I can screenshot it, um, I'll do that. And then I'll just grab everything I can and just dump it into pure ref here. And you'll see that it's going to take a second. I'm going to pop up here. Cause I need, there's some really awful references that I I'm using for this. Um, so then I'll dump all my references here and I'll, I'll do a couple things like, uh, I'll align, I'll align them. Sorry. You can, uh, normalize by scale. Let's see. Line by, uh, height, size. There we go. So I'm just affecting the size here and then I'm just going to arrange by optimal. So this way, the all the uh, all the references are equal size. So there's there's no one image that feels more important than another. Um, reason why I do that is because uh, your brain, as you're working, um, even though like let's say I'm I'm looking at this guy right here, this uh, this very very cool sculpt of uh, you know some torn flesh and stuff, even though I'm my brain if is, is looking here. Um, I'm also picking up references and information in your subconscious, right? So your, your focus might be here, but your brain is also picking up signals from this and this and this and this and this. Um, so all of that stuff is sitting there in your subconscious. So, um, what happens is this is how you get like happy accidents. You start getting like little, um, little happy accidents or little like I don't know, just things pop in, in there in your brain and it becomes like this soup of stuff um, that that sits in there. So even though like my focus is over here, over here, um, 
you know, there, there are things that kind of pop in and out as I'm working. So you just want to let, let your brain kind of do what your brain does. Um, um, I try not to look at other artists work um, while I'm working. So like um, finished pieces uh, uh, like illustrations, things like that, uh, specifically other artists designs. And the reason why is I, I don't want that. Um, I don't want their style to seep into mine. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I, I can be very ad adaptive or, you know, absorb information or, or things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of letting the vibe or mood kind of settle in, um, as I'm looking at all this stuff. So this is all just references I collect from, from, uh, practical effects artists. Um, reason why I go to practical effects versus looking at like other ZBrush artists is because um, practical effects is all grounded in nature or <laughs> not grounded, but uh, uh, it, it, it's grounded in space. Um, Adam, hello and welcome. That's me, Jared. Hi. Um, so so I'll, I'll, it'll kind of like ground my, my thinking as well. Um, that's why I, I love practical, practical effects. Now, even as a digital guy, I love digital sculpting, right? I love ZBrush artists. I love looking at, at what they do, but I'm trying to gather information from elsewhere. I don't want, um, anyone else's influence affecting mine. So I'm going to kind of carve into the obliques here a little bit and I want that rib cage to kind of pop out. Also, uh, like, like this one, this is kind of like right in the zone where I'm, where I'm trying to hit with this one, uh, kind of like really messed up journal, you know, like we were saying, journal Chernobyl, uh, Turkey people, right. Okay. So getting my, um, getting my base kind of into a position cause he's going to be, you know, he's already curled up. So I'm going to kind of reach for that real quick. And then once I have it in kind of the general position, then I'll take it a little bit further onto uh, like the, the actual pose. He's got to have really slender arms. Like all of his body is really atrophied. This is not a, a creature that's like, it's meant to be more, um, I don't know, probably existentially horrific, uh, and, and visually horrific. So this is probably something you wouldn't see, you know, right away, unless, uh, you know, this thing's mutating over a course of time. David, welcome. David Kuo, amazing artist. Um, we're just going to like chew away at his face a little bit. I'm going to just continue to mask and uh, mask and pose. Um, for for masking, I have a I do have a hotkey set. It's a uh, I have my hotkey set to tab for blur mask um, because blurring the mask is, is something that I use a lot. So I've, I've set that to tab. His legs are going to be kind of atrophied and weak. And uh, so there's no muscle development. Like this guy can't move. So like maybe... You know, this family, maybe like a hills have eyes kind of family. Hey, thanks so much, David. Good to have you here, man. Um, it'll be fun to, uh, you know, if this thing is really like just atrophied and weak, and then uh, maybe we see it, you know, it, thinking cinematically, you know, you're probably not going to see the, the creature a whole lot, you know, either till the very end 
Um, you know, it's going to be hinted at. Um, maybe this thing would have like a couple stages to it, you know, where uh, uh, if we're just developing the story here, maybe it's, uh, you know, a farm couple and they've been trying to conceive. And they, they've tried all kinds of techniques. Maybe, uh, maybe one, one night they pray, and they pray really hard, and they pray for a baby. They pray for a baby, and uh, they're praying for that baby. And it, maybe it's the same night as like a radiation leak from a no, from a, like a nearby, uh, from like a nearby, you know, nuclear power plant or something, or a chemical leak. And so maybe because they're a farm couple, they don't have a lot of access to, uh, you know, a lot of access to uh, uh, news and information. You know, maybe they're wi they don't have Wi-Fi or anything like that. You know, kind of think of an old school farm couple. And they're, they're praying for a baby. And it just so happens like on the night of a, a huge ecological collapse. And they find out, they do the deed and they find out that she's pregnant. But it's with a horrible turkey monster. Or maybe things look normal, you know. Maybe everything looks normal. And then you get a horrible turkey monster in there. I don't know. I find uh, you got to have, got to have a story. Like that's what's going to make your, your character so much more personal. Um, you know, if you can develop a little story around them. Because if you uh, you don't have a story, you know it's real easy to. What I found for myself is that I uh, I start spinning the wheels, and then I start chasing ideas. What happens is uh, I'll be like, "Oh, what about this idea? Or what about this idea?" And then you're like, "Oh, I want to I want to get this one. I want to get this thing in." And you gotta squash that. You gotta kill that habit. Because it's really easy to get distracted. So what I find is now, obviously, I have a, 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 a you know the streaming platform now, and I I prompts you know that are going to help kind of motivate me. Um, but what I've found is like sometimes the hard part, just you know, what do I make, right? What what do you sit down and make? So you have to find a story, and. Um, Eventually, over, over time, when you're no longer thinking about the technical aspects of what you're doing, like once you, you, you're just comfortable in the software or whatever, you'll, um, you'll eventually just need stuff to think about while you're working. Like, what do I make? Um, and so what I learned from a, an amazing teacher, um, Oh, God, I'm going to brain fart on this. Why can't I? Oh, Mark De Decker. There it is. See, that's called latent learning. That's where something comes to you after you're thinking of it. Um, oh, this is a really cool idea. Yeah, that's awesome. Meets farmer and a turkey, right? Let's, let's make some scary turkeys. Turkeys, like, are not inherently scary to us, I guess, because we eat them every year. Um, it's, it's such a thing that you don't think about, but like, these things are awful. Look at that. That is just horrific. You know, nature is terrifying. Um, so anyway, you gotta have a story. Uh, the story is what's going to keep you engaged and keep you motivated. And then kind of what's fun is you you start finding and developing that story for yourself. And you may find that you actually want to, you know, develop it further um, and actually like really want to tell a bigger story. Um, that's also kind of a trap 
it can happen too is is you fall in love with something and then you're you're just in you're just in love with it and um and that happened to me i had a i had a uh, creature design that i did just for fun and uh i fell in love i fell in love with it now i i wrote a short film about it storyboarded the thing we're gonna try and shoot this thing next year um but that story keeps you engaged it keeps you keeps you really um really focused too storytelling storytelling it's a big part of the character arts imagine that um so right now i'm just using uh, clay buildup for for everything uh, clay buildup is pretty much mm, the number one brush you're going to be sculpting with. Uh, second only to like the move brush. I've been told that I wiggle the forms. Uh, I'll kind of like, I'll kind of wiggle it into the place that I want. So I'm trying to atrophy everything. Uh, so there, there wouldn't be a lot of like muscle density or, or anything like that. This thing is... Um, shriveled so actually on on some some of my references that i'm looking at right now uh i'm looking at some um you know severe muscle atrophy and um it's uh you know it can be um obviously very disturbing to look at this kind of stuff when you're when you're doing this all day uh and eventually you kind of shut not shut down the feeling part of you you can still feel stuff very deeply, um, but you you kind of learn to uh, look at it, you know, just from a, a technical standpoint. My father was a doctor too. Um, probably hear me talk about that a lot because uh, uh, my that and then that's where my morbid sense of curiosity came from. Is uh, my father? He used to show me books of. Um, Civil War medical oddities. And these were, uh, you know, this he was very curious about medicine um, that was practiced before they had, you know, the modern advancements that we do today. So my dad passed his morbid curiosity on to me. And I didn't realize that, you know, uh, that that's, that was going to become kind of a key key factor in what I do every day. He, um, he told, he told me that, uh, for him, uh, he saw a dead horse in an alley way. Uh, he grew up in, uh, Chicago, um, you know, during the depression. And, um, he said there was a, a dead horse in the alleyway. And that's what made him, you know, he would go back there and play around it. Uh, and uh, he said that's what motivated him to want to study medicine. He wanted to understand all that stuff. And that's, uh, that's what he did. He went to medical school, uh, you know, while working three other jobs. Crazy. And, uh, and uh, with children, too. You know, he had three daughters and he went to medical school. Um, now my dad also loved movies and uh, that probably, you know, another factor to why I'm as uh, thoroughly messed up as I am. And see, he had morbid curiosity and he had uh, and he loved movies. Loved Schwarzenegger movies specifically, so I saw, I saw Total Recall in theaters as a child. When did that come out? Total Recall. I want to say it was like what, eighty nine? No, I'm probably way off. Nineteen ninety. Okay, I was nine. Probably. Yeah, I was nine when I saw Total Recall in theaters. So that explains a lot. 88. Was it 88? It says 
but um i remember <laughs> it's a good guess it's a good guess um but yeah i remember seeing total recall in theater and uh I remember seeing Alien 3 and, and a lot of these movies um, that I was not supposed to see. My mom also took me to some of these movies because I because I insisted. Uh, I, I insisted on seeing Tremors uh, in in theaters. And uh, Tremors to this day is still just one of my favorite movies. Uh, but I remember Total Recall was a big um, was a big kind of a, awakening for me. Uh, uh, in the monster life. And it was specifically Quato. If you guys remember uh, Quato. Total Recall. You know, this, this, uh, uh, this sequence in particular, I, re I remember very vividly as a kid. And then, um, oh, the cab driver from Total Recall. I remember this one too. Uh, Benny. Benny. That's right. I have five kids to feed. And uh, <laughs> different Benny. Yeah, this this was it right here, man. Um, when I saw this arm reveal, this, this was mind-blowing to me. This was... Uh, this was uh, uh, like this was it, and and I saw his arm unfurl, and uh, and I was hooked. I was like monsters for me. This is my life. This is what I'm gonna do. Um, I didn't know that. Like I didn't realize like, oh, you're gonna make monsters all day. So it was, I just knew that I loved, I loved that. That's what I saw. I'm gonna move the arms down now. And as you can see, I'm also working very low poly, like fairly low poly. I um, I teach at Noman as well. Come take a class with me. Uh, if you can, come 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 join me for a class. Uh, one thing I see a lot of students do is uh, they will they will jam up as many polys as they can, right? They're like, hey, if 500,000 polys are cool, then 500 million polys are cool, right? And so they'll like, they'll go nuts. Uh, they'll go nuts with it. And really, it, I, I think uh, it, it's like a stage thing. So when you're kind of building out a stage, um, that uh, uh, starting at a at a lower poly count, and um, is is easier. And then uh, you know, if you're brand new to ZBrush, stay under at least two million uh, when you're sculpting. I found like in the two million range is about as high as you want to go, uh, at least for for blocking out forms and um, and things like that. Um, okay, we'll let's do some uh, some questions here. Uh, so David asks, when you started your career, were you ever concerned that focusing on monsters only would limit your opportunities? Uh, truth be told is I didn't think about it. Uh, I, I, it, it was never, I, I, I wasn't, I was so like unaware of the industry and, um, unaware that concept art existed. Um, this was, you know, obviously 11 years ago. Um, when I, when I was going to Noman, uh, prior, prior to Noman, I have a, I have a theater degree. Uh, I'm an actor and, um, so I, I really did not know that concept art existed. Um, and I didn't know that, uh, I didn't, I didn't know that it, you know, it was a tough market or, you know, anything like that. Uh, none of that, like even registered to me. Uh, it's, it's all kind of silly. Um, cause I know there, there are dudes that like, they know right away that this is what they want to do. I had no idea. Um, so when I was at Noman, 
Um, one is I was I, I just wanted to study visual effects. Um, I didn't I didn't know that there were fields within visual effects that like I was incredibly ignorant about the the industry. Um, and uh, so I, I like none of that made made any sense. And I figured, uh, you know, I'm I'm 28. If I go to the school, I'll get certified in two years and I'll be out by I'm 30. Um, clearly visual effects is, you know, not, you know, going anywhere. Uh, CGI is, is, you know, very important in the industry. I had played with ZBrush two, uh, back in the day. And, and so, um, and that was just me kind of like wanting to learn stuff. I went through a phase after, after I graduated where I was just trying to, um, learn as much as possible, whether, uh, you know, about filmmaking, I was, I was uh, storyboarding and, you know, doing other things. I was trying to just absorb as much as possible. And um, so, so when I, when I went to Noman, uh, Jared Morantz was teaching there um, at the time he was splitting a class with um, Hong Lee. Uh, and that was, uh, I think my fifth term. Um, well, yeah, David, you're, you're good at everything. <laughs> your work is just killer um so so for me yeah I, I saw jared morantz and he showed his portfolio and that was like my my light, light bulb moment because i um you know up until that point i i had only studied um and hong took over for feng zhu i didn't know that i did not know that alex um yeah, and, and Hong was getting really busy. And so they split the class between Hong and, and Jared. And so I met Jared uh, uh, in the latter half of that class. And he showed his work. I mean, and Hong was Hong's work was amazing as well. Um, so like between the two of them, it's like, whoa. And, and then when Jared showed his work, his portfolio, I was floored. Um, like I, that was my light bulb. Um, that was, I was like, I want to do that. And I didn't, I didn't really ever consider that like, uh, it would limit possibilities. I had, I had no idea. Um, and so I, I, I ra you know, uh, you know, so I was, I was already into it. Jared asks, uh, his class, um, you know, they, you know, we, they were happened to be looking for interns at, at Aaron Sims. And he's like, is anybody interested? My hand shot right up. My, I was like, I was like, boom, right here, me, me. And, uh, and I know, and I know Morant, like I, I saw him like, I saw him, uh, there we go. We'll do this. I, I see, I see kind of Morant's head poke out and he's like, is that Jared? Okay. And I see him like kind of shrink down again. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that was, that was it. Um, and so the night, so I gave him my, my number. And then the next week I was, I was at Aaron Sims. And that was, you know, um, I was, you know, they just needed somebody to organize their, um, their files. So they didn't really, they weren't really, I don't, I, you know, I was kind of the pilot intern for them. Um, I've been a lot of pilot interns. It's really interesting. Um, so he was, uh, you know, I, I, I just, uh, they had me organize their, their reference folders. That, that's what they needed. Um, so that was kind of my, my start there. And so I spent a lot of time, you know, uh, hours because I was going to school and interning for Aaron at the same time. And, um, and so I was just organizing their, their, their file folders and that kind of, I think that what I was doing there, um, was I was rewiring my brain. I didn't realize what was happening. Um, but I just, I sat and I, I listened to them. I listened to how they talked as designers. Um, I listened to how they, you know, handled clients and, um, you know, how they hand tackled professional projects. 
Um, that I think was all very crucial to rewiring my brain. And I was doing this uh, at the same time I was going to Noman. So long answer, a uh, way, way, way long answer around that, uh, that whole thing is uh, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't, I had no idea that, uh, you know, choosing to do monsters would, would limit my career in any way. I just, I just followed exactly what I was passionate about. Um, and so far that just passion, um, has, has led me to some very cool places. It's good. Or yeah, I love an origin story. Uh, yeah, I gotta admit my, I was, uh, I felt very lost, uh, before, before Noman. And then, uh, I met amazing people and all my peers were, you know, just incredible. So, uh, awesome, awesome opportunities. Very, very lucky. I'm going to shorten the legs up a little bit. Uh, and I think, you know, this is very crude. Right now, but you can see kind of kind of where it's going. All right, we're we're getting there, and we're gonna have to like, you know, really work the body up. You know, this would this would probably take a little bit longer. I'm doing, but whatever. We're just here to have a good time and talk about monsters. Definitely skips leg day, and. Um, Really want those pelvic bones to pop. Very gross. Had to work on some gross things. Actually, for this bird beak, I'm just gonna straight up use a brush that they brushes that they have in ZBrush. So I'm just gonna grab the Chisel organic, I believe. Give it a second to load. And what's nice about this is it has like actual beaks in here. And just straight up draw them on. And it's okay that it's going to look like weird. Um, have I ever seen a monster or film or game that I thought was too gross? Um, great question. Um, I think the shock value of something like uh, uh, it comes from the stakes in the story. Um, because I may... I have a very iron stomach when it comes to looking at, at horror. Obviously I consume a lot of horror content. Um, I, you know, I, I watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of horror movies um, all the time. So my, my sensitivity level is a very different than say my wife, who is very uh, sensitive to that stuff and she's squeamish. Um, so, so for me, I, uh, you know, that nothing bothers me, you know, um, but what scares me, um, are, are the things that are the stakes in the story. Um, so example of a very terrifying movie, uh, and you all know what it, what it is, is hereditary. Um, the reason why hereditary is so horrifying is because he, you know, he goes there um and you know there there's that scene uh in hereditary and y'all know what it is um and that is um you know that's what that's what's horrific you know yeah yeah it's a rough it's a rough movie yeah so it's it's uh to me it's the stakes involved and uh, uh another a uh, great example is um, Channel Zero. 
if you guys have not watched that show, um, Channel Zero. Channel Zero. Yeah. Yeah, I have a terrible spelling. Anyway, um, Channel Zero. And um, this show, uh, this series in particular, is is uh, one of my favorites. Um, and, and the reason why is is the the steaks are very personal. Um, also, uh, brand new cherry flavor was pretty gruesome. Uh, so they put some weird stuff in there. I think uh, if 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 we're talking like pure grossness, like the grossest creature. I think ever put to film is the thing, right? Uh, uh, and um, Rob Bottin's effects uh, in that movie are definitely what helps um, sell it. Let's get some like bulbousy kind of like he's not gonna have you know uh, we'll, you know a couple of, he'll have a couple eyes kind of mutated. I'm thinking about like a gully neck, you know, very close to the to the bird reference. It's actually okay that, um, you know, that the the sculpting is going to look a little wonky, um, you know, and and we'll go really asymmetric with it as well. So uh, before I do that, I want to I'm going to tighten up some of the the forms a little bit in symmetry, and then we'll start adding. Uh, asymmetry at kind of like the last uh last little bits but we'll do things like you know crook the crook the beak you know one way you know one way and then the other and that'll look weird i'll give it a really bizarre kind of feeling you know um start adding some crisscrossing lines these are just kind of uh you know sketchy sketchy marks just to remind myself that this is going to get um, messed up in in the neck in particular so it's i'm not committed to anything what is that started what is what started hey droids welcome um as far as like hotkeys go i have um i have mirror and weld set to a hockey and i also have uh Mirror and weld, and then mirror as well. So that just helps me speed wise. Um, also, what helps is um, is uh, you know if you cut something in half, you only have to work on you know kind of this side of the body. So it just kind of helps you know whatever ways you can limit um, you know how much you're seeing. Um, if I have specific reference as well, I'll follow the mirror side or I'll like, I'll mirror, if I'm working on like say the left side of something, then I'll, I'll mirror it over to the other side and then, you know, work on it that way to match. It just helps um, save some time. Let's see. Neat. I need some ribs in here. So I'm, basically going to describe these in i don't ever worry about like making perfect lines or perfect marks um that's something that you know it, it really depends on what you're sculpting if you are say doing um stylized work you're gonna probably really focus in on on really tight shapes and everything is very planned um, and chiseled um, with creature stuff, I like to be loose, loosey goosey. I'm going to get them um, an extended kind of pectoralis now, like a, like a chicken breast. It's just blending that that edge of human and animal now. What are you all doing up this lake? What are you working on? Yeah. 
that's the thing is uh art is an addiction isn't it love love making it when you finally have like a um specific epiphany about what you're making or you feel like you've leveled up Ooh, it's addictive isn't it feels good and then you plateau for a while and then you're miserable just utterly miserable but then you plat you know then you peak again and you're like ah i feel great i'm the greatest and then immediately you fall apart the next day that's why we're all a little bit crazy Have you ever made a piece where you felt possessed, like while you were making it, where like all time and space like just melted away, as and you just knew that I had to, uh, you just knew that you had to make this thing. Now that is a feeling when you're totally enveloped, totally enveloped. Adam, you're working on some character armor. Let me guess something Star Wars themed. Did I get it? I got it, didn't I? Yeah. Star Wars, man, they got all the good monsters. Got all those good monsters. All right, so now I'm going to, I want to add more depth in the torso as well. So the arms are going to be tilted, rotated forward. The scapula are going to be more to the side. Because we're going to want to see some um, kind of arched spine stuff. I'm actually going to flatten out the torso a little bit too. Gotta drop a new Mando. Yeah, that's right. Heck yeah, man. Excited for Boba Fett. I better see some huts in there, man, or I'm going to be pissed. I want to see some like, because there's supposed to be like a whole bunch of gangster huts as well out there, isn't there? Yeah, hell yeah. I want I want to see some huts. Like, what, ask yourself, like, what do I want to see in a Boba Fett series? I want to see some huts. I want to see, uh, I better see a rancor. I want to see him like ride a rancor, or wrestle a rancor, right? I want to see some bounty hunters. I want to see some droid bounty hunters. I want, you know, I better see some lasers. You know, he's like, pew, 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 Bosk. Yeah. Oh, cantinas, man. I want cantinas. I want lots of juicy cantinas. <laughs> yeah, I think um, there are times when you want to work on stuff. And then there, like, there are shows that like I want to work on, but at the same time I don't because you just want to enjoy something. Sometimes if you get close to something, it, it can, uh, you know, change your perception of stuff because you start critiquing it on a different level. Oh, they changed the design. Oh, they did this. But um, when you're And you get to actually like enjoy something. Mandalorian. See a heavy metal style animation with a story about space wizards. Oh man. Space wizards. You know what I love? You know what I want to see? I want to see a, a silver hawks. I want that to make a comeback. And a part of me wants to do fan art for it. I mean, I would love to do fan art for it. Should probably do fan art for it at some point. 
But I love Silver Hawks, man. I was like, they also won for like having one of the coolest intros. Silver Hawks and uh, like Thundercats. Oh man, same same animation company too. Um, wow, Silver Hawks is so cool. Okay, so arched spine, right? And uh, you know, the whole time I work, I kind of sight it from the uh, from the silhouette here. Um, you can see, I, I, I mostly work with a lot of sculptors now, but now I've, I've got to start dynameshing stuff because it's um, starting to get a little, you know, that geometry is starting to get a little wonky. There we go. So that took a long time, uh, and my, my poly count is too high, and that's because, um, one, I had project turned on, and um, my my resolution is a little high there. Um, the other thing you can hit is uh, oh, my my little graphics bar is covering it. I just realized that. I'm gonna turn that off. Hey, hi. Um, so I have a bunch of buttons down here as well. So uh, I'm turning project off and I'm turning uh, the resolution off. But if you if you hit the resolution, you hit that little button right there. Um, what that does is it makes it object scale and then Dynamesh. Um, I know they added, they added a picker, like a Dynamesh picker to the new version. I haven't gotten to play with that, but I will. Oh, I will. So there we go. Now we got, got that in there. Start blocking out the abdomen. That little center line down the abdomen, a uh, little indication of a belly button. Uh, not sure if I'll keep a belly button or not. I might do like some organs coming out. I didn't draw that, but uh, maybe like some spilled guts. Oh, like an embryonic sac. That's gross. Let's do that. Yeah. Mutated turkey boy. And uh, we'll... We'll play with scale a little bit uh, more as we go. I'm going to pull these out for the for the turkey wing. So now we've got the the actual turkey wing, and then we'll then we'll get like some fingers on top of that thing. I'm debating whether I just want to like pull it out or use a, a brush that I've made. You know, I'll just use the brush. Right, just save yourself the time when you can and sync it all together. Every sculpture has kind of, um, you know, if you think about it in kind of three major phases, there's, um, there's the block out stage. And then there's the stage where you start adding structure to that block out. And you just refine, refine, refine. Gargoyles. Man, I love that show. I really, really want to work on that. <laughs> uh, it's bonkers to me that, that Disney hasn't done anything with that. And I'm, I'm sure they're, they're talking about it. Um, but like, where is my Gargoyles movie? Because Keith David, the voice actor of Goliath, is a natural, is a national treasure. And he's one of our greatest living voice actors and we need him that live action movie everything keith david is and he's the dude is just so good yeah okay so i'm starting to define that scapula the spine of the scapula terrace major terrace minor infraspinitis You don't have to know the name of uh, 
all the muscles, but it sure helps a lot. You can just remember the shapes that they make. But I find that, um, so my dad was a doctor. If I mentioned that he was a doctor, um, but that just made me curious, you know, about where everything is. They're all matter of fact, trapezius muscle, rhomboids, just blocking in the latissimus, coming down to the base of the sacrum. Good references, man. That is all, that is just everything. I have good references. And I don't know. I, I don't know if because I'm streaming it, I, it was probably not appropriate, but like, I feel like I need a warning. Like if I could show you guys this stuff, but like some of y'all have sensitive stomachs, be surprised. But used to be, uh, you know, when, when working at the studio, um, I would, I would always have this just most horrendous shit on, uh, on my computer screen and the guys would like look over and they'd be like, Whoa. um, or some artists, uh, you know, we're not comfortable with, uh, Sounds very familiar. Um, some artists wouldn't uh, <laughs> show it. Uh, some artists will, you know, are were uncomfortable working with like really gruesome stuff, and they're like, "Oh, Jared will do it." I think the worst thing, you know, anytime you have to like do messed up children. That, that's always like, I think the hardest part is you have, um, you know, it, it's not, it's, it, you know, one, you're, you're looking up references of kids. And so that already feels weird, even though it's like a, an essential part of your job. Um, but then like, yeah, 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 exactly. And then, uh, and then you, and then you have to like turn them into a monster or um, for, for it, I had to do some, children that were like eaten, you know, like uh, Pennywise had like, like taking big chunks of their brains out. Um, that was, that was tough. That was tough. And then you, there are other things where you're like looking at anorexia or deformities, um, you know, horrible afflictions that people are, are suffering that that you know that's very uh intense sometimes um but it's uh referencing it's a part of reference you have to understand the real world to to be able to recreate it you have to understand those things uh are why my my dad had a huge fascination with that stuff um uh, he was very interested in like timey freak shows and you know stuff like that and he showed me he had all these medical textbooks that he loved to show me i um, mean he also encouraged me asking him questions like why is that why why does that happen so the arms are going to get bent so i think i'm going to bend them a little bit more actually one hour in and for like a general work day of eight to 10 hours, about eight hours, you can get a lot done. Um, and that's also with regular breaks throughout the day. Um, Got to take regular breaks, stand up. Um, usually I exercise on my lunch times. I you know, get some cardio in if you can. No, I'll, I'll go into that probably on a whole, I got a whole thing about that. Taking care of yourself as an artist, both, uh, both mental and, and physical. Um, 
great question comics um uh, my my dad uh you know he he was a lot older uh when i was born so uh, when i was kind of at that phase where my career was just happening he was a lot older he was in his 80s and um he had seen a few of, of my movie of things i had worked on uh like he saw the turtles and he saw i think gods of egypt and i think he saw peach dragon um so he had seen things that i worked on or that i that, you know i told him that i worked on and he you know at that point he was like i get it you know i i understand now um so you know when i told him i was gonna be an actor that was obviously not uh he was not thrilled with that um <laughs> you know he he'd wanted me to be a doctor um and so uh i was obviously bent towards creativity um was not a great student uh in high school or college like just smart enough to like get by without like really applying myself um so i didn't have the grades for for any kind of good schooling um you know uh uh my sats were terrible um like horribly embarrassing um and actually i have a funny story about that uh but um yeah so so you know uh career aspects for me were low and expectations were low um so when i you know was finally able to like show him um you know how i was uh you know working and making a life and you know i i had met my now wife um he was like okay i get it now like he he understood and he's like he's like i don't know how you're doing this i don't know what you're doing but it's working for you <laughs> uh so it was very it was you know i was like okay i had, i had i was able to survive as an adult he so he was pleased and and that's not to say he wasn't supportive of my acting as well um he he saw a lot of my plays and and uh was very very supportive um you know, my dad had a, uh, uh, all kinds of interesting things about him. Um, you know, he was a photographer, he was a, a doctor, he was an adventurer. Um, so lots of interesting stuff going on, uh, on there. Um, but yeah, when I, when he was finally able to kind of like see that I had made a life for myself and I was able to, to thrive and build a family, he was, he was, he was happy for me. He passed before I uh, before he got a chance to meet my kid. Um, that was a couple of years before he got to meet the kid. But uh, you know he was happy, and that's so that was closure we needed, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. So back to ZBrush. Hi. Uh, keeping on topic, um, how will you try and make the hands tapering? Um, do you know a better way than the inflate brush um, to get the the hands to to really taper down to points? Um, what I found is you have to just pull, pull down and down and shrink your brush as you're doing it. Um, so there's hotkey S. Um, this is in there by default. Um, it's it's also like spacebar. Spacebar also has. Uh, the, the size toggle in there as well. So you can like space bar, it's over here, space bar, space bar, right? Space bar, space bar. Um, but my index finger is always on S key. Um, and this just uh, figures your draw size. Um, so I'm always kind of shrinking and moving, shrinking and pulling um, till it gets, you know, as fine as it needs to go. I'm thinking of um, turkey wings. And and all all shapes generally you you know taper thick to thin, um, you know I'll I'll pinch, you know as as needed, um, to get to get it to taper as, as much as possible. Um, ultimately, 
you know, the, you have to, for, for my job, what I do is I have to ask myself at, at any point, like, what can I get away with um, as fast as possible? Um, that's going to give me the, the shapes that I need. Um, Cause it kind of depends on the circumstance. Like am I sculpting for an illustration or am I sculpting um, for a, uh, you know, a 3d model full design. Uh, so the, it's going to vary depending on, um, on, on what it is. So like, if this is something like, I, I know if it's too thick, uh, and it looks thick in the render, I can always like pinch it down. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. He was, uh, it was very cool. Um, let's see. So yeah, I'm just kind of building on a base there. You know, also, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, okay, is this going to be 3D printed? Is this going to be an actor? All the all the necessary questions. I'm going to taper this torso a little bit more. Start tucking that that pit in there. Really get really get in there and, and just pull in all right so the, the torso makes an egg shape um so in this case because this is a creature um he's going to be kind of oblong yeah again again i'm looking at uh some reference here off screen just some messed up stuff Yeah, yeah, there we go. You see what I'm looking for is that webbing uh, from the, the pectoralis as it's wrapping over and kind of meeting the deltoid in there. Sometimes you can get that really thin kind of skin in there. And then I'm gonna, there's a little bit of a gap here before the pectoralis inserts. So, trying to get that depth in there as well and then here is the acromion process aren't all monsters under uh, you know misunderstood right that's one of the great tropes um you know is that monsters are um you know they're a piece of our kind of humanity um speaking of which uh the original misunderstood monster right Frankenstein. I just got just got that toy. In it, man. I dropped my pen. Um, but yeah, the the original misunderstood monster. The monster was uh, Frankenstein, the doctor. Monster, you know, monsters kind of live a life of pain. Um, it's painful to be them. They're, they're always kind of hurting and they want, you know, whatever that is that they want, but generally it's to be, you know, normal you know, or they just want love, right? Yeah, it's great. Swamp thing, right? All monsters just want acceptance ultimately yeah that of course depends you know on the monster the genre and all this stuff of course there are monsters that always want to eat you and consume you right there's the the monsters that are you know that's when you get into creature territory i think um a creature you know when i think of creature versus monster um a monster is is something with um a little bit more humanity um whatever you you take that to be but uh i see um creatures as as more unfeeling kind of um you know just the, you know, things in nature, 
right? Uh, nature ultimately does not care a lick about you. You know, uh, uh, nature is cruel and harsh. And um, so nature creates things that are also cruel and harsh uh, to survive a cruel and harsh world. And if, you know, the, the epitome of that is, is alien, the xenomorph, right? Um, excellent uh, observation. The xenomorph is like, it does not care about you. It does, you know, it is simply there to exist, procreate, re, you know, and, and move on. Uh, survival of the, of the species and, and uh, to, you know, force its will upon you. And it does not care about you, you know, cannot feel um, intelligence, definitely intelligent. That's, that's what made, uh, Cameron's aliens really, really powerful, you know, when he had the, when he added the queen element in there and there, you know, uh, uh, Ripley is fighting with Newt, you know, and, and there's the alien queen there and it's two mothers against, you know, two mothers opposing each other. Um, by the way, if you ever, you know, if you, if you get a chance, watch Cameron's masterclass, uh, that he did on, on, filmmaking um for a short time i had that a subscription to master class and uh his his lecture is just fantastic man the, if you love filmmaking that was a fantastic lecture and that that one just pumped me up um just just you know knowing how he thought about thought about film and how he put that stuff together so cool going for that carved chest here this guy's, you know, he's, he's starting to come along uh, as, uh, you know, as it slowly kind of comes together. I actually have some bird feet. I'm just going to fuse in there. So for me, it's, again, I'm going shopping. See, and I, here's my creature folder. And because I've been teaching at Noman for so long, um, not so long, uh, but I've, I've been teaching there for eight years. Um, that's a lot of demos that I've done for students. You know what I mean? And I do a lot of demos with them. And now, now I, I'm not able to do as many kind of like individual demos. So I'll, I have like so much stuff that I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on this and show you this part of the process. Or I'm going to work on this and, and show this part of the process. Uh, I am 40 years old, 40, 40, yeah, 1981, excellent year, because that was the same month MTV was created, and we're both still around, it's pretty cool, um, so I am on the old millennium spectrum, I like to call it old lennials. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I didn't really get my career going until I was in my thirties. Um, so, uh, after college, I kind of bounced around, you know, I was trying to figure out what to do with my life, you know, after college. Um, cause I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so I worked, you know, various jobs and, um, I, I did theater and, and, uh, you know, um, for a time I, I formed a production company with, um, with a couple of, uh, friends. Um, and we got really close, uh, to getting some projects produced. Um, but things fell apart in either financing or, or at the contract stage of things. Um, but we got really, really close on some projects where we were just about to, um, you know, for, for TV series and all this stuff. Um, so we got, ah, we got close, but what we did is we developed a lot of content. Um, and we did the, you know, and I did this, you know, with them for about two years. Um, so, um, we developed a lot of content and that's where I really honed a lot of storytelling skills. And, um, it got me practice pitching. Um, you know, we, uh, had pitched projects to shadow machine and, uh, uh, pitched a project to uh, Haim Saban, um, 
which, uh, you know, now I think about the projects, they weren't, they weren't there. Um, but that process of like going and going out and pitching and, um, uh, that was also really beneficial to me. And that's, that's ultimately why I, I started leaning more towards, you know, being, um, working on stuff behind the camera or in production versus um, wanting to act and, and be on camera. I just got really interested in storytelling and development, um, particularly IP development um, was really interesting to me. And um, I was doing a lot of drawings and putting together pitch packets and, um, uh, and doing things like that. And then uh, our company collapsed and uh, you know, our, our, our project did not, happened did not materialize even though we were um very very close we had a you know all the actors lined up and you know uh statements uh, uh of agreement i'm just not focused here where is i was looking for some bird feet um so we got we got close and then uh, anyway that led me to uh wanting to you know learn uh visual effects so I was just thinking, man, I, I gotta, I gotta solidify some kind of um, job prospect in here. I had some bird feet, I swear. Where did those bird feet go? I have claws. So you're just going shopping. I know I had some bird feet. Bird feet in there somewhere. You can just see like all the stuff I've collected. Um, Students don't normally see this because, you know, I'm when I'm working on uh, uh, at at Nomen or in teaching, um, I show them like how to put stuff in your light box like this. Oh, those are I have zombie bird feet. I know I had other bird feet. Hmm. All right. This is a big, big roundabout way to say I'm probably just going to have to sculpt it for now. Oh, no, they're there. See? found it bird legs they were called bird legs um here we go see look at that and that, all the sculpting right there right who needs anything else so what you do i'm just gonna dynamash it and then you know i sculpt with a set of bird legs for a project dynamash I'm just going to grab the knife tool, cut that off. There's a little bit of um, garbage stuff going on right here. So reset that auto group, auto group that boy. Burp, burp, delete, done, right? So sometimes just a little bit of um, searching and shopping. It's going to save me some extra time here. The other little tiny bird feet. Yeah, you got little bird feet now. Little bird feet, friend, and we'll we'll make these messed up and kind of deformed because that's just the whole part. That's just all of it. Okay, so you can see like if I scale up and I move them in, they're going to start collapsing. So just want to make sure we rotate those out. Ponyo, you know I have not seen Ponyo yet. Should see Ponyo. Watch Luca. I loved. Well, I should say that my kid made me watch Luca 500 times. Okay, so we got bird feet. We got weird bird hands. Uh, I'm just going to chop these legs off. Animesh. Mash this together. And then we'll do a little smish mash. Smash them legs. Smash them legs together. And it doesn't matter that this is like garbage, like, because we can, you can always fix it. Merge down. Hit OK. Dynamesh. Now it's fused. 
Okay, so now the legs are fused together. It's getting close. Grotesque, just grotesque enough. Watch Ponyo while eating ramen. I love ramen. Miyazaki always makes food look amazing. That's how you know, like, you're doing good animation. So if it makes you hungry. What would you say is a typical turnaround time for a 3D concept sculpt like this? Now it's a day. Um, or at least uh, it, it depends. Um, you might get like a day or two. Um, you know, ideally, uh, it's, it's like one day to model one day to render and paint. So that's about two days. Um, you know, this is, you know, why, why do this when, um, when you can do more sketches probably in that time. Um, it's just a, a method of how I work and, uh, you can, You can get some very uh, what I think are, are realistic results in that time, um, which helps sell to the client. Um, nowadays, uh, 3D um, is is normal, uh, so um, so they're used to seeing 3D models. Uh, even a few years ago, they weren't uh, quite you know used to it, but now clients are very used to it. Um, so you tell them, you know, I work, I'm working in 3d, they go, great, cool. Um, and that's just because the tools are more accessible and all that stuff. You know, there's so many, you know, available, very good tools, uh, organizing. reference images uh yeah yeah you got to categorize that stuff um like for for me um the way i've broken it up um and and referencing is so important guys is so so huge um and and i learned again i i learned to reference you know being at, at studios and being at noman they you know they really hammer that into you Um, so I have things broken up into hard surface, um, you know, other, um, art stuff. Uh, this becomes just my dumping ground. Um, now that the Dropbox has a, a phone app, sometimes when I'm bored, I'll just organize reference. Um, but I have it broken up into art, creatures, costumes, uh, Gans, if I, if I have something that I particularly fall in love with, I will, um, I'll fall in love with it there. Um, so like I'll, I'll create a folder for it, like Ray Punk. Um, I was really into like retro sci-fi for a little while. I mean, I'm still into it. Um, so yeah, break, breaking it up and then breaking up categories into categories just like that. Um, uh, my anatomy folders are just, you know, I've built up over the years. Um, bodybuilders, reference packs, uh, uh, drawings that other artists have, have grabbed, you know, um, resolved as well. Um, cause I, I want to see how other artists resolve form. Um, you know, what, it doesn't matter if it's a drawing or a painting or, you know, whatever it is, I, I'm, I'm collecting it. Um, I can be a little bit, I don't know if that's obsessive, but, um, but it also um, it, anatomy for sculptors, they're, they're huge. Um, they're, they're kind of anal analysis of, of form and all that stuff is just, uh, it's incredible. So um, highly recommend uh, uh, that and uh, organizing, uh, 
all that stuff. Um, Arcane, I started it. I have not, I have not uh, dived into that yet. Um, I got to be honest, the the Riot style is is not not for me really. Um, that you know, I I totally get you know what why people like it. Um, <laughs> I got viewers dropping off. No, um, uh, no, riot riots. Uh, I think it's a very particular style, and I and I think um, it's very cool, and it's it's obviously um, well crafted. But I I just it's not it's not what I'm into. You know, it's not for me. And I I, I might. It's probably because I'm old. Or not, I don't know. Um, I'm glad it's doing. You know, I'm glad it's doing well. Because all all animation, when when you know when that's doing well, it's it's good for everybody in animation. <laughs> yeah, you know, like um, uh, I'm glad people are loving it. Um, I, I I don't know what it is particularly about it that that it I I. I don't know why it's for not for me. Um, I think it's, I, I think it's just giant armor doesn't. It's not my thing. I don't know. Um, and then this is probably because I've not done any research into the series, like League of Legends. I don't know anything about that. I'm. I, hey, people love it. That's that's awesome. You know. Um, because all of that is good for everybody, you know. Find something you love, support it, support artists, be passionate. So now I'm kind of just noodling about. Um, now that I've got kind of the major features in there, I'm I gotta kind of work on the silhouette a little bit. Get the pelvis to kind of line up a little better. All of my creatures tend to be neutered anyway. Well, but sometimes I'll put a little uh, south mouth in there. A little south mouth. Line that up. You know, all this... Uh, all this is meant to be atrophied. So this is not a, a character that, you know, is um, athletic and has body mass. This is, you know, this is a horribly mistreated, malnourished little bird man, little turkey bird man. Gonna sculpt in the legs here. Get the calf muscles to blend. And just liney, you know, all, all I'm really doing is just sketching out the muscles here. And I just kind of repeat over that over and over again until it eventually looks right. Silhouette is your number one kind of thing to keep your eye on. Uh, keep a tight, clean silhouette. And then everything you do within that silhouette, it, you know, it's the shapes within the shapes. There you go. Little malformed bird man. Sad little dude. We haven't even, like, gotten to the kind of fun stuff yet. I'm going to mask out this head because now I'm going to scale it up a little bit. And what's cool, uh, I did get to play with this, is that the... Let's see. We play with a little bit of the, um, the focal shift. So uh, a focal shift now works with... Um, the gizmo and really it doesn't matter because it, it's supposed to work with multiple sub tools and i don't have multiple sub tools so it doesn't really matter 
Oh, they did get to put it down. See, I'm scaling up the head here because that's going to indicate youth. Bigger the head, we we associate larger heads with younger um, younger people. Like children have large heads, right? Proportionally to their body. And getting pretty close to a, to a point where we can start, you know, maybe wrapping some skin around this. And then moving forward from there. I did say I want to put some can you know some fingers in there. So what I'm gonna do is I've got a brush for that. You can see how my brushes are laid out as well. I will buy brush packs, I will um, you know do whatever is necessary. Um, at least for you know on a per project basis, I will like if there's a thing that's gonna help me, you know, a cloth or a stitch brush, buy it. Um, and then you only have to buy it once. Oh, what's going on? There we go. So I have a, I have a brush that I made. And, and of course, making brushes yourself is uh, extremely gratifying. And then you don't have to spend any money. But you got to do that work up front. So I've got... Where are you? You know what? I bet he's in my organics. So I've got, uh, let's see, let's see if I put them in my organic folder. Um, so I've got some brushes that I've made for boils and uh, stuff like that. So I'm definitely going to put that to use. There we go. My twister finger brush. All right. So I've got some fingers that I made. And what's nice about these is they can be fingers, they can be thumbs, they can be whatever you want. I'm going to use like just a slightly bent finger. Oh, what happened to you? Oops. Accidentally rewound in time. Come back. There we go. Well, that could have been awkward. We're going to just draw on some fingers. Little thumbs. And because it's going to be, you know, somewhere between human and uh, bird, so it's okay that they look, you know, out of place. Like it'd be like, that's essentially going to be like the thumb here. And then let's do like, should I do a straight finger? Yeah. And then, you know, the minute you add something very human to something, to a shape that's, that's uh, abstract, um, that becomes horrific to us. So seeing human, forms next to something that's inhuman that's going to be scary okay we got to go back is this bent fingers working so i'm just going to duplicate yeah that guy's just working this guy is just only known suffering And that's sad. That's sad. He didn't ask to be born a mutant killer turkey man, but he's a killer turkey man, and that's what he is. That's what he's going to do. He's going to, you know, uh, maybe he does go through some stages, right? Like um, they've back to the story, the family. They prayed for a, a baby. And what they got was a mutant turkey man. And that mutant turkey man, they fed, even though he, you know, it was their great shame. They couldn't, you know, parade him around the the people. You know, I don't know, I don't know who the people are, but they can't, you know, show the people. And so this family, they hide their little turkey man. And he grows and he grows. Maybe he hits like this horrible stage later on, you know, and their their secret is out and he's killing and eating people. Maybe, maybe they have to say 
Stop it. Stop it. You know, there's always that sequence. Am I going to give it some hair feathers? Probably. It'll be sparse. Really, you know, uh, you know, not not like fully covered, but like a. Uh, sparse and get them. I need to get them shoulder blades up. There we go. There. Killer Turkey Man. It's, it's not his fault. Maybe that's the tagline. It's not his fault. Damn you, Turkey Man. What did they name him? You know, what did what did they name their turkey boy? It would have to be like something biblical. It would be like Ezekiel or Zeke. No, not gonna name your turkey man Zeke. Zeke the turkey man. I beg your pardon. Uh, I like my. I like my original one, uh, which is uh, Gobble Gobble Murder. <laughs> Methuselah. And you have to be like Luke or Paul or could be Mr. Wimbley Pimblesmere. Okay, so now just evaluating again. Uh, I'm going to run back to my well initial sketch. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, now that I see that, I'm going to shrink the pelvis a little bit. Shrink the legs and pelvis together. I have a focal shift turned on. Shrink that down. Ooh, that's fun. Yeah, this is with focal shift turned on, so you get this warping, which is really, really cool. It's very useful. Actually, that that kind of works as opposed to shrinking the whole thing down. Maybe if I turn that off. Yeah, that just scales it all down now. I actually like a little bit of that warping. We'll do a little bit of warping and then a little bit of scale. And then I'm going to uh, keep tilting the body around like this. We're going to arch that back here. And then I can probably slim. Uh, this always happens um, when you're sculpting up arms um, because you need to kind of build the bulk of the muscle to before you kind of shrink it all down. So I'll... I'll kind of bulk up the arms a little bit uh, while I'm sculpting, and then eventually I'll I'll kind of shred it down a little bit and continue to pinch until it's oops. Yeah, see my symmetry got messed up, so this is why it's good that I um I have mirror and weld. So. We're just slowly kind of creeping it into the into the position and kind of sculpting it position wise. And are those fused in yet? Uh, we'll just start fusing and blending that stuff in. You know, this is still kind of a very block in stage. So now we're we're getting close. And I'm going to mute down a lot of these scales. These scales are would be something um, that would be happen if he was a little bit more developed. But I'm going to keep these scales, you know, kind of fleshy, and 
even melt down the nails a little bit. This is, you know, something that's a little less developed. And I'll probably even replace these, you know, throw in some like human toes next to them. Just so there's like some contrast between the, the bird parts and the, the human kind of blend. Because if you go too creaturey, then it all becomes kind of unrecognizable. Now I'm just kind of working on that arch. Heat there. This is like definitely like a cottage core kind of creature. Something that would be like an A24 or in a, a neon. There's the pelvis. And we're going to find the great trochanter right there. Oh, that trochanter is so great. It is so great. There you go. So all those muscles, you know, they they don't even have the opportunity to develop. And it's essentially just, you know, just a little bit more fleshy than a skeleton. Just kind of assemble your piece and then, you know, sculpt it into what it needs to be. Work simple to complex. Start simple, get complex. And those glutes here. Jedediah. It could be a Jedediah. No, that's like, that feels Amish. And this is just like a, you know, they've got to be like, if you're thinking about reasonable casting, this would be, um, if it's modern day, right? Because the story we developed is that they were living next to a nuclear power facility. That would obviously change the story. Pulling, pulling these forms, these little web shapes. Little webby flaps. So for a couple hours of, you know, me talking and, and sculpting, you can see we've made it pretty far. Gotten the whole kind of head and and body in there. Wings. Wings. And little slender legs. Getting pretty close. Um, I'm going to keep bending the toes to get this kind of nice flow. We're getting, you know, kind of as close to the position that he's going to be in. And then, you know, pose wise, it's just kind of laying one arm down, leading one arm out, and then. you know, folding the legs together. A picture, it's like, it's, it's kind of like, like breathing very heavily. He's very cute. Oh, can you please show how to put these in Lifebox? Yeah, totally. Um, so what you do, what I, what I've got, what I've done, um, is I've got my Z tools here. So I have my Dropbox. Um, 
in your Dropbox, I've created, you know, I've created a, my ZBrush folder um, with all my Z tools in it that, so what I'm doing is I create a, a shortcut that shortcut goes into your uh, program files and you go to pixel logic. And in this case, I've got the new update and you drop the shortcut into Z tools. Um, let's say Z tools, Z brushes and Z alphas. It's pretty much the main three that I've done. Um, but occasionally I'll, I'll create a projects shortcut. So that all goes in there. And then, so when you open it up, there's your shortcut at the bottom. And that shortcut is um, what I'm going to for my library. So every time I save out, I'll save this as uh, what? Thanks killing, right? I'll save that as thanks killing. And now that I've saved that, I know that that's uploading to my cloud. And then when I go to my tools, you know, it drops, you know, I, I see my shortcut here, Z tool shortcut. So I know where that's linking. And then now he'll show up right here. So what's nice about this, this method is that you have a visual of your Z tool um, versus like having to look at file names because uh, I am not a file name person. Uh, like I can't look at a file name and like immediately know because I have terrible file naming skills. Um, but that's generally, that's generally what I do. So the advantage is um, you get a visual representation in Lightbox and then you, uh, and then you know it's uploaded, you know, to the cloud um, because I've had way too many hard drives crash on me uh, for me to not be completely paranoid about how I work. You only have to learn that lesson a few times. So we're just indicating where the muscles are again. You know, you just keep kind of re-sketching uh, the same areas over and over again um, until you find the shapes that you like. Right? Just keep working them, uh, you know, working over those shapes. Kind of, and then slowly it kind of starts coming together. So there's the infraspinitis here, which is travels all the way down here. Terrace major, terrace minor, latissimus dorsi, traveling all the way back down here. Indication of the lumbar spine, the two spinal erectors that cushion the spine, keep it into place. Then all the way down to the coccyx, the tailbone. And actually because he's a bird, he's a bird boy, we should pull out a little bit of a, a tailbone for him. Some people are born with vestigial tails, which is terrifying. Nowadays they can remove it, but once you kind of, once you learn what like, you know, you see pictures of vestigial tails, go ahead, look it up. Um, you know, you can see how people came up with myths like demons and, you know, other things. Once you kind of know the horrifying truths of medical history, uh, a lot of legends start to make sense. Subcutaneous horns, you know, which is just keratin. It's nails that are growing out of the head. You can look up that one too. Cutaneous horns. I'm going to teach you all the horrible things and I'll let you look it up. So there's a little torso here and I can just, you know, I've, I've, there are times when I wish I could animate because it'd be fun to see his little like, you know, his little chest kind of moving and breathing. I always kind of, you know, even though I don't get to um, rig and animate characters, I can, I can visualize how they're, you know, going to move or, or breathe. So 
So getting all the anatomy in there. And his ears are, you know, I've, I've kept the ears in place and I, and I'm, they might be like the one perfect thing about him. Like the one thing that really functionally works. How horrific would that be? You know, he's got to listen, you know, uh, to people talking about him. Like his parents are standing outside the, the barn and, and maybe they're like debating, you know, do we kill this thing? You know, we love him. Oh, and he's got to listen to all of it. That's, that's what makes something tragic. You know, this is definitely a tragic creature. And eventually he would break free and slaughter his family. Take vengeance on the, on the poor farmer couple that all they wanted was a baby. All they wanted was a baby. And they got the turkey man. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the, the twist at the end of the movie is uh, he eats them on a table. Maybe he evolves. Maybe it's, yeah, maybe he evolves a little bit further. Oh, God. And he, he becomes a little bit more human. Baba. Baba. Oh. Maybe because he's a turkey, he's they you know they would keep him out with the other turkeys, but they would have to keep him cloistered and separated, right? So he just watches all his turkey brethren just get killed. Maybe there's like one turkey that like is actually nurturing him. Oh, and they slaughter that turkey for Thanksgiving. Ooh, man, this is getting dark. I like it. Let's write it. Comes like this. Dark Turkey Avenger. Just ridiculous. Most monster movies are a little bit absurd. That's part of the deal. You have to be willing to take that. Yeah. You have to be willing to kind of laugh a little bit. And that laughter is also a part of the release. Humor and uh, horror are very close, you know, laughter and, and fear. You know, you're pulling that tension, so sometimes, you know, it's okay if something's a little absurd. Oh, that's not... Let's see. Hmm. To become more human, he must eat people. I like that. Gives him a reason to kill. Right. That's another truism for, for horror films is uh, you got to have a lot of kills. And that's, um, that's actually a, a, a written thing that studios are looking for is they want um, a kill about every 10 pages. So if you think about a, um, about a horror movie slasher movie just about generally every 10 pages they'll have a kill and this you know of course depends on the genre gotta have them kills i watch a you know in, in addition to uh you know watching artist blogs and um, you know, everything like that. I, I watch a lot of, um, videos on production on, um, on writing for production on storyboarding, uh, cinematography, uh, watch, I watch all of that. You know, when you're, when you're working all day, you just have time to, you know, watch stuff because eventually you, you'll, you know, you kind of pick up enough competence to be able to do this and um you know keep your mind entertained so i listen to a lot of um writers blogs and uh filmmaking blogs things like that film analysis and breakdown why does that stuff help you because 
you know, if you want to be making stuff for film, you have to know, you know, you should know everything about it, right? You should know how movies are made. You should know how, uh, you know, how they would build this practically or digitally, because that needs to be something you uh, need to be able to communicate with the client. And they say, well, how could we do this practically? Well, this is, you know, this would, depends, right? It might be a, a, a latex puppet, silicone, you know, because they'll want to put some bladders in there, you know, you know, make it pump. If it's a digital creature, great. Have topology and all that stuff. So before we can do that, we have to, you know, sell the idea of the creature. But also, if you can speak the filmmaker's language, you can say like, oh, you know, this would be, you know, a, a very crucial moment. How do those details that you're putting in there, how does that help further tell the story? I had, um, I had a project I worked on um, and I, put a little detail in there and um, they, they loved it and they um, can't talk about the project because it's still happening. Um, but they, they love this little detail that I put in and they actually started, you know, writing that into the script. So you're, you know, you can also help inform the story through design. And storytelling. So, in order to do that stuff, you have to understand storytelling and design and story structure. You know, um, most of the time, your creature is not going to be the featured thing. You're, you know, it's going to be about the the people around the creature. And then your creature is going to make some kind of entrance or, or something. Now, I don't think that always has to be the case. I personally would love to see um, creatures as characters, you know, have a bigger part in the story. A lot of people feel like, uh, you know, once you show the creature, you know, all the magic is gone, right? The fear is no longer there. Right? That's why so many uh, movies and features are, you know, they're, they're hidden. You know, they hide the creature away until about the third act. And you get your, you get your big reveal. The creature steps out into the light. And then usually that's when it loses its, um, you know, loses the magic. And it kind of, uh, you know, then you hit into the third act where the hero has to defeat the alien, the monster. We've seen it. We know what it can do. Uh, you know, we know the stakes are possibly world ending for our hero. So we're not as, uh, you know, invested, you know, in, in the fear. Yeah. And then and then you've seen the creature. You're like, OK, I've seen it. You know, and then you start, what do you start doing? You start doing that, um, that thing where you just compare it to everything else. And you're like, oh, it looks like this, right? Yeah, pumpkin head is amazing. Um, awesome, such a cool creature. And what's cool about Stan, um, Stan Winston, you know, directed it. He, um, he knows how to shoot the creature and how to cut. Um, that's what I think a lot of um, horror directors aren't comfortable with uh, today, at least shooting practical. Um, but I think practical done right is just gorgeous. Um, yeah. Super eight reveal. I love, I actually, I really like super eight. Uh, that was Neville page designed that one, I believe. 
And Neville, of course, has amazing creature anatomy. His like his his anatomy can be really unique. He's always really, really good at it. Yeah. Yeah, once um once the creature is revealed, you're you're you don't feel like you're in danger anymore. So that's what a lot of um a lot of it is is, is it's it's hiding the creature for as long as possible, um, raising the stakes, and then um, and then once we see it, you know, it's it's actually good that we we don't feel afraid anymore. Because that's what horror is. It's a spo you know, it's about um, facing fear. Um, it's about looking fear in the eye and saying, "I'm not afraid of you. I can conquer you." And that's uh, uh, your metaphor for um, anything you want it to be. You know, it's it's looking something horrible in the face and saying, "If I can survive this horrible thing, then sh you know." Uh, if I can, if I can survive this horrible experience in film, um, surely I can, I can face down whatever I need to in the real world. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all, it's all psychological and it's all metaphorical, um, because we are, we are human and humans, um, we, we really think about, we respond really well to metaphor, um, as a means of, of coping with, you know, the trauma of existing, <laughs> you know, uh, cause you know, life is, is hard and it doesn't matter who, you know, who or whatever you are. Um, we all have a great struggle. You know, there's that, that axiom of, um, be kind for whoever, you know, you meet, um, is facing a great battle. And I'm paraphrasing that. But um, that is that is the essence of of fear. Um, we are all facing some horrible trial, and so we deal with it with metaphor. Metaphor is really powerful for us. This is why the hero's journey, um, Joseph Campbell. That's why that cycle is in every nearly every film. Um, to some degree, the, the, the call to adventure rejection of the call, um, you know, you can't go back to the old world, um, the mentor, you know, all those tropes, those are all very deeply psychologically buried in us. And, um, whether we, whether we know it or not, like your, your average movie watcher may not be able to pinpoint what it is, you know, but they instinctively know it because they've been exposed to culture their whole lives. So horror in particular, where creatures appear, um, usually have to do with the, the, the hero's journey, who the hero is, um, what their, what their unique, um, experience is in, uh, and, and how the creature relates to that experience. So that's what's going to really, um, that's, and that's what makes it personal to us. And that's what makes it terrifying. So as long as you can take your story, your creature, and give it that kind of personal touch to it, um, it's going to make it even scary. Now, your viewer, whoever you, is looking at your art, they're not going to know your story. Um, they don't have the access to your mind, um, to your, uh, you know, to your to your thought process. So you have really 0. 0.3 seconds uh, before your viewer has made up their mind. And, um, you know, because we're, we're doing this on our phone, right? We're scrolling. So you have a very short second window of time to, to capture your, your viewer's attention. 
So what's going to capture their attention? What's going to make them stop on your image and look at it? Well, obviously good execution, right? If it, you know, if it looks like it was well-made and well-crafted and thought about, um, if there's a story in there, you know, what, what's going to keep them there? I think, um, if you're looking at fan art, um, you know, the, the process is a little different because you're like, oh, I know that character. How did that artist execute that character? And so I think fan art's a little bit easier because we all know XYZ character. But if you're doing any kind of other art, you're going to have to get their attention. It's very hard. Do I ever break the model up into parts to work with each limb separately, or do I keep the model completely together? Yeah, it depends. Um, uh, sometimes I will do, I'll just, you know, hide selections and just work that way. Uh, now that um, Sculptress works, you know, with uh, with visibility, then um, then I'll, I'll do it like that. Um, so yeah, sometimes I'll break it up. Sometimes I'll keep it all together. It kind of depends character from it is a good example of fan art yeah absolutely well it, it happens whenever um xyz popular thing happens um you'll see this explosion in fan art and um that's because uh one people love xyz thing and they they want to create and share in that kind of community um that is created you know it's like been Baby Yoda, man. Uh, Baby Yoda got made, and, and you know, fan art everywhere, everywhere was was Baby Yoda's, um, and that's awesome. You know, people are um, they're excited and they want to share and want to make and create and be a part of it. Um, so that's fan art. So fan art is a little bit different. It's a, you know we consume fan art differently, I think, than we can consume other kinds of art horror horror art you know that's uh that's also a part of a release you know it's a it's a chemical release in our brain um fear you know it's 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 a it feels good to be afraid because we know if you know we can imagine things more horrible than our experience somehow makes our experience a little less horrible. So just kind of working in some um, skin wrinkles around this this bag here. I haven't really um, sculpted some eyes in yet, but we'll we'll get there. Right now, uh, you know, I've, I've got a lot of sketchy marks from um, clay buildup and everything. So eventually, I'll just kind of smooth that down. But it's kind of uh, like kidney shapes or or like shapes that like resemble organs. Um, that's also something that's always terrifying to me. So you can see I, I'm, I'm actually a very loose sculptor, I think. Um, I'm, I'm kind of sloppy. Um, and that's just because I'm usually under deadline. And I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more in the image business than the 3d modeling business you know for me it, it you know the the final image is more important to me than the than the concept model and that's concept modeling you know it's it's a different kind of um different kind of thought process so i've cut it in half uh now i'm just going to isolate the arm anyway so like like here as i need to sculpt on the inside i haven't i haven't touched this yet so the inside here and then just working out the tricep and again you know the the muscles kind of bulge out a little bit as i sculpt them um and i have to kind of shrink them down a little bit each time so let's pinch this down 
I want to hit that wrist joint too, right about here. Where the ulna is reaching the wrist here. And then a little bit of the webbing from the palm. Does ZBrush have any kind of rigging system? No. Um, you can use Z-Spheres to, to essentially set up a Z-Sphere rig. Um, but it is... Um, I, I don't use it. Um, because it takes too long to set up for, for my process. Um, for me to get... And, you know, I, I just don't get good results. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm not using it. Um, but... You know, mostly you just get good at posing enough, and and you won't you won't need to use it. Just you know, understanding the posing process, which I'll I'll show it I'll show on the stream at some point. Um. Yeah, I'll, I I wish um, I wish they would update it because um, there's some really nice like IK posing stuff in Blender, and I I. I know they're going to get to it at some point. Paul, if you're hearing me. That's all I want for Christmas, baby. I just want some IK posing. Right? It's a, it's there in the curves. That's what I want. Maybe we'll get there. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, I got lots of tricks. You guys stay tuned. I got all the goodies. We're, we're barely scratching the surface here. But, you know, this is it's fun. It's fun to just sculpt monsters and create horrific stories. I do, um, I do a fair bit of writing as well. Um, it, you know, they, they say once you do what you love, you know, get a hobby. Um, my hobby is, is writing <laughs> and producing. Um, But writing, writing will teach you so much. And uh, it's a whole different part of your brain. So practicing writing um, and writing is going to make you, uh, writing is going to make you a, a much stronger concept artist as well. Yeah, I, I, I want some IK posing, please. <laughs> Not that, you know, not that um, transpose, you know, transposing is pretty easy. I get, you can pose something pretty quick now. It just, it just sucks. Cause I, I want, cause I've, I've seen it, I've seen it. And I know, I know it's out there. So it's like, make me happy. There's a little hole in there. Ooh, close. There we go. Okay, so in like a short time, we've got like the most of the muscles kind of developed. I think I'm probably ready to start kind of creeping up on resolution a little bit more. We'll creep up on that a little bit. Dynamesh. All right, so I'm about like 2.7 mil. I'll lower that just a little bit. Okay, so I'm at 1.5 now. Um, I'm going to pretty much stay off of Sculptress now. That's not true. I'll probably go back. I love you, Sculptress. Don't ever leave me. But now I've got parts in there. What is the subject of the evening? Hello, Neil. Welcome. The subject of... This evening is thanks killing gobble gobble murder. Gobble gobble murder. Uh, so this is a um, this is a horrible leftover. Um, the story that we've developed is that uh, uh, a farming couple 
Um, they wanted to have a baby. They prayed so hard for a baby. And the night that uh, baby was conceived, there was a horrible nuclear accident nearby and a toxic gas was released that they inhaled and they, uh, they didn't know this because they're a simple farming couple, um, detached from the internet, uh, you know, living in isolation, just living off the land and, and living for each other. And they, they wanted to have a baby to share their lives with. And so they prayed so hard for a baby and they had, <laughs> damn you DuPont. Um, and so this chemical cloud was released. They didn't know. They didn't know it. Maybe it, it happened while they were sleeping, you know, slumber, you know, that, that sweet slumber. Uh, so they go through a, a, a normal nine month, birth, you know, preparing the room, doing all the right things. You know, he's building the, the, the room or he's building the crib and maybe he's like great at woodworking. And, um, the night comes and they have their baby. She has it in a bathtub, you know, and, uh, when he finally pulls the, the baby out of the water, it's horrible turkey man, baby. And they're horrified. They're horrified about what their, their little baby looks like. So not knowing what to do with their new horrific child, who they loved and they prayed for, they... Shiloh their baby away to, to the barn with all the other turkeys. And they built a little room for him out there in the turkey barn. They still love him. <laughs> Better than a Gary Busey gingerbread man. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, the mommy survives. They both survive. And they're, they're torn because, you know, maybe they've been trying for a, a baby for a long time. And, um, and this is everything that they've ever wanted. You know, it's, it's the thing that they want most. So this is something that happens in stories where the protagonist gets something that they want. At the same time, they get something that they don't want. And so that's as an essential conflict. Um, and you'll find this uh, is very universal throughout films as well. Your character gets something that they want and something that they don't want. And so obviously they're, they're terrified of their freakish turkey man baby. And so they start... They, they don't know what to do. Maybe there's a couple times where they break down and they're very close to killing it, you know, because it's a horrible abomination. You know, it's not right before God. You know, they're very religious, very pious people. So they don't know what to do. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, because we got to, now we have to involve the town here. There's a pretty good bridge add-on for Blender to send ZBrush to GoZ. Um, yeah, hey, Jack. Uh, uh, there is a, a GoZ. I, uh, that was a very quick question flash. I won't do that. Um, there, is a, there is a GoZ plug-in to Blender. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, I, just, I don't have time. I don't have time to, like, GoZ something. Um, you know, I would love to be able to, to take stuff into Blender, but... Um, in truth, for my process, when I'm on when I'm on crunch, I, I do not have time. And now I that's probably because I also haven't spent the time to to prepare that that workflow. But for me, it's not worth it to to export to any other program because I am so I'm usually under a a, a crunch, you know. 
uh, concept art in an illustration, like illustration, you have a, a ticking clock, but it's like down the hall and you have to squint to see it. Um, concept, you know, that ticking clock is in your face, like right in front of you. And it's just like, you know, you got deadlines, you got deadlines, you got to hit. Yeah. Cause you're, I, your boss or your client might call you and they're like, Hey, they moved the meeting up. Uh, we gotta, we gotta, we need stuff. And you're like, okay. And you gotta crank stuff out. That will happen to you. You know, that will happen is your, your client will call and they'll need something immediately. You're like shoot. Yes, I'm working. Yeah, so now, oops. Um, so now the husband, maybe he feels, um, yeah, I saw that, uh, uh, Jack. Um, I saw this, um, I saw that talk. It's an awesome talk, and it's true. He, he's definitely, um, <laughs> yeah. You're right. Uh, it, it's a great talk. Yeah, everything has to be very polished now and, and um, faster and less time. And that's because clients have wised up, you know, they wised up, they know how, you know, they know how fast it is. This is why it's actually important to slow down. And, um, take your time or, or purposely slow down. Cause I've gotten so fast. Um, it's actually not good. So I have to slow down and actually like take my time. I have to force myself to, to, to slow down quite a bit. So maybe the husband, he, um, he goes, Confesses sin, to the preacher, you know, and tell the preacher about what's happened. Because he feels so guilty that he's brought this horrible abomination into the world. But, you know, he's also taught that uh, everything, you know, is, is God's creation and you have to love it. So maybe he's, um, he's very conflicted. So he goes to uh, yeah, Racerhead. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, heck yeah. Got to um, look. Everything's an homage to everything else. So you know, embrace that. And it's, it's like it's like a Racerhead, but this. It's like a Racerhead meets Lamb. Or um, I mean, really, this is actually. Um, the Dun, you know, there's a little bit of Dunwich horror in here too. But yeah, the um, husband he he goes to the preacher and he confesses his sin about wanting to kill his creation, you know, what he's brought into the world. And maybe at first the the preacher is a little skeptical, or or. Not skeptical, but maybe suspicious, you know, of uh, because of how the this guy is telling him this this sin, this story, and so he maybe the the preacher offers to to go out there, you know, to to see or or to maybe I can offer you blessings or, you know, talk to your wife, console your wife, whatever it is. And the farmer's like, no, you can't do that. You know, cause he's trying to hide this thing. And, uh, and then the preacher, the preacher sneaks out to the farm. 
to go see for himself. And that's when he hears this horrible shrieking cry of the turkey man. <laughs> we'll have to come up with a cooler name than the turkey man. We call that in development. But it would be cool because maybe, uh, so you got to add more conflict in there, more and more conflict. So maybe the preacher was supposed to, you know, hold a, a mass, you know, that night or something. And he doesn't show up. And so the, the townspeople are worried. Then maybe like the, you know, someone saw him like, oh, I saw him going up over yonder hill. Townspeople have to go there to see it, you know. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to work that. We'll, we'll workshop that a little bit. And sees the farmer killed. Mm, that's interesting. It's a good twist. Yeah, ultimately, it's got to be, you know, the the couple, they have to survive. You know, now their creation gets out. And this is probably after it's grown a little bit. You know, this is, you know, cr creatures also, we like to see stages of growth as well. You know, this would be, this is obviously like first or second stage. This is probably like, we would say second stage. Um, you know, the first stage would be the, the baby, um, where it would look, you know, we would see it and we would see like the beak or something like that. And then we would, um, we would see that. And then this would be the, in the barn stage, you know, where he's, maybe he's, put it you know out into the barn with the turkeys it's very silly when you put turkeys into any equation but we're going to take it seriously maybe the uh there might be one stage after this uh like a, a child stage and then we would see like the grown turkey man stage which would probably be more you know, standard bipedal, probably the dude in a suit kind of situation. So the first stage, the baby stage would probably be a latex puppet. And then uh, this one could also be foam latex. And then a little CG augmentation on top. It just helps knowing uh, knowing the process for for digital or uh, for practical, because then you can just communicate that to the client, you know, because they they're looking to you for solutions. So I spent a little time on the back. Yeah, we're getting close. It's now now slowly kind of starting to come together. I mean, we're we still have to go through you know a little bit more sculpting. But the, you know, the major kind of landmarks are there. He's got the kind of overall sickliness. He's probably still looking a little buff. Um, but that'll, that'll kind of soften up when we add skin to it. So I think, I think I'm probably ready to start adding some skin. Basically just kind of smoothing down some of the main kind of they build up marks. We can still work on the silhouette and um, work on the feet here. Everything's going to kind of curl around. Still have to put some human toes on that too. This, mine it up, curl the toe.
silhouette needs work still. Ultimately, you know, this is, we're going on, you know, almost three hours. So that's a good chunk of like work time. And we can make pretty good progress in, in just a very short, short, short period of time. I have to pinch this together now. And everything is emaciated. Everything is uh, thin and, um, you know, malformed, deformed. Nothing, nothing's really grown right. And then that way, when we go to the final version, it can be like hunched over, you know. <sighs> mommy, mommy. This poor, tortured soul. I think ultimately that's why why it works is you have to uh, is you have to kind of pity the monster a little bit. Yeah, you have to pity the monster, you know, and, and in a way, even sympathize with it. The gobbler strikes. See, now this is a genre thing too. We could do thanks killing, but it's a dude in a mask. You know what I mean? And he's the Thanksgiving Day killer, right? And he goes around stuffing people into turkeys, right? That's a whole different genre. We're doing the the monster movie, you know. When the in the slasher movie, the 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 thanks killing slasher movie, he would be. You know, he would be a guy who had some traumatic event at a, at a Thanksgiving Day dinner once. And then he would uh, he would go out and like put on a, a turkey mask and like kill people. Right. And he does it with a carving knife. You know, one of those electric like, you know, and that's what he's doing. That's a different movie, though. It's an entirely different movie. In that movie, he would be like going after elite people, you know, the wealthy, uh, the wealthy Thanksgiving uh, families. They get their turkeys imported. <laughs> Fetal mannerisms on point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anytime you have something like curled up, you know, in that position. And then, uh, you know, larger, larger head, smaller, smaller feet and, and, and body. I might even go a little larger with the head. So we really get that fetal, fetal look. Oh yeah. Island of Dr. Moreau. 100%. You know, there's, there's so much in that. Um, anytime you combine a, a human and animal together, right? Human plus animal creates X, Y, Z. Anytime you have a, a human and animal, that's what makes, makes something scary. So we got to curl this around even more. I love, by the way, I love Island of Dr. Moreau. I know it's not like the movie that um, it, like they expected it to be. I don't know. It, and, and like, you know, Brando was on set, you know, just improvising shit. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's, if you watch that documentary, uh, the making of that movie, um, it's wild. Um, it's really wild. So I've, I've heard horror stories, you know, about, about it. Um, 
it, it's kind of one of those you know things of legend now the making of that movie but i i love it, it, it i love uh val kilmer in it and um feruza balk is in that as well yeah see now i'm getting some like curl in the uh some arch in the femurs a little bit of there with the knee kind of sketching out where the knee knees going probably use um, some of the scale brushes for this but not all the way Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the the making of Island of Doctor Moreau. Um, I have to find what is that? What's that called? And I love the book too. I I read the book a lot. Um, making of Lost Soul. There it is. Um, it's called Lost Soul: The Doom Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Doctor Moreau. Um, great documentary on the making of, uh, of that movie. Um, it's true. It's pretty wild. Um, and, and people that remember talking about it, um, and also the actors, you know, that have to go out there in these, these makeups. Um, I, I guess at one point Richard Stanley had hid in a tree cause he didn't want to film. Um, like, like crazy stuff, like bonker stuff. Um, they also were filming during a hurricane, uh, as well. So, I mean, like, uh, just bonkers, but like, I'll tell you, man, I love the makeups on that movie. Um, even, even Brando, uh, Brando, you know, doing his Brando thing. It was, I mean, uh, bonkers. Um, but I mean, oh, the, the, the makeups on this were so cool and so elaborate and like, they must have just been so freaking uncomfortable shooting this stuff. Uh, you know, you have all these actors out there in like, uh, you know, just crazy, heavy, you know, hot costumes. I think also Stanley had done like a bunch of drugs um as well I, I think that's john i don't know if that's john or not but that's shane mahan uh he's one of the co-heads of um, legacy fx awesome dude one of the coolest dudes um i love everybody there obviously but um this everyone is so cool i i love hearing those stories uh, i think it deserves uh i think it deserves a little bit more credit uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go out saying that I think it's a, it's a better movie than, uh, than it got credit for in, in the day. Maybe I'll tweet about that tomorrow. We'll talk about it. Cause, uh, I love it. Oh, okay. So we're, we're encroaching hour three, um, you know, from where we started, I'm going to clone this. Let's go. Let's see if we can take it back to square one here. This is probably a terrible idea and it's going to crash. Sometimes it's just fun to crash your machine. Crash the brush. Oh, it's on Tubi. Hell yeah. Tubi is awesome. Oh, there you go. Oh, I didn't take it all the way back. I just took it there. Anyway, uh, let me let me see where that is on Tubi. Tubi is like has become one of my favorite streaming channels just because they got a lot of movies that probably aren't very popular. <laughs> oh, 
Oh yeah, they have. Um, oh yeah, they do have it. Um, on Tubi, uh, Lost Soul, the 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 journey on the island of Doctor Moreau. So um, there you go. Uh, all all you need for Tubi is just sign up, and then um, it's free. But it has ads. Um, they they run commercials, so that's how they how they do it. Um, but uh, so I I recommend it. Fully fully recommend. It's a wild, wild story. It's wild. It's wild. Love my little baby chicken boy. He's my little baby. My little baby chicken turkey boy. Poor little unfortunate soul. Poor, poor little boy. Okay. So I think that's probably as far as I'm going to be able to take it tonight. But I'll probably uh, continue working on this and then get it closer to, uh, um, you know, the next stage, which is wrapping skin around it. Uh, I need to do things like, you know, add some asymmetry. And that'll be, you know, doing things like, uh, you know, pulling some goobers out of the head, you know, just making some weird abstract shapes, you know, twisting the beak up like... Uh, EMT, there we go. Twisting the beak up because that's going to be fun, you know. If, it, if it's almost a little crooked like this, you know, and you just see these like little weird, like, you know, little little fingers, things like that. Yeah, it's a little bit cute. You know, you're gonna want to like hug them and squeeze them, and maybe we get a stuffed plushie out of this. Uh, personally, I think we need more monster plushies you know, of disgusting flesh monsters. That's me. That's what I want. And I'm pretty sure everybody wants that as well. All right, let me save this out. It's killing. So I think that's, uh, that's it. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, I know I, I would love to go another hour, but I, I have work and I, I need sleep. Um, Thank you all for joining me. Uh, I had a blast tonight and uh, very excited to continue on this guy and uh, his next his next stage and next journey. So thank you all for joining me and um, hopefully next week we'll get uh, we'll get Matt Miller back in and we can uh, work continue working on our zombie clowns. So thanks everybody for joining me and. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. So thanks for thanks for coming and hanging out, talking some monsters. Uh, feel free to follow me on Instagram, Jared Krzyzewski. That's me, me, or uh, my Twitty, which is at uh, MonsterMash042. So come say hi. Follow me for my dumb musings and all my shit posts. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming and hanging out. Have a good night. Get some sleep. And uh, I hope you're terrified.